get started. Um, so I just hit the, I uh, want to make sure I, I remember to hit the record button. Um, let's get started. Uh, a couple housekeeping items. I wanted to make sure that everybody was clear that, uh, that I got the homework graded. I've got uh, our homework 8.1. Uh, 8.2 is due today. Um, I, I've gotten homework 9.1 finished. I, I literally just got it finished right before lecture, so I, I didn't get a chance to upload it yet. Uh, but that'll open at 11, so it'll it'll be available. Um, I wanted to take a quick second before we get started and mention uh, a little something called Chegg, um, uh, and and it might it might not be Chegg. It might be um, I don't know, like an old textbook or, or, or some notes you found online. I just wanted to mention something. So I was noticing on the, the last uh, homework assignment that a number of you had uh, used some formulas and some equations that, um, that we had like never discussed in class. And, and I want to be clear, like, I know we're, we're dealing with some really weird times right now uh, with, with COVID-19 and we don't have like the in-class instruction like we normally would have. So I, I don't know that I really have a problem with folks like going uh, online and seeing if they can find like some help on, on some homework. I mean, keep in mind, first off, I'm always here. You can always send me an email if you have any questions. You can, we can arrange like a, 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 a phone call or a video chat or something, whatever we need to do. But I wanted to mention a little bit of a warning about something like Chegg. Uh, it's not that I have a problem with it. It's that for classes that uh, rely on code-specific um, calculations, it's usually wrong. Um, at, at least if you, all I can say is this, if Chegg was being used on the last homework assignment, then it was steering folks down the wrong path. So the last homework assignment, the 8.1, the one that we did on development link, um, a lot of, uh, there was about maybe five of you that were using an equation that was from a really old version of the spec. To, to, to put everything in perspective, right now we're using, like everything that we're teaching in concrete design is based off of ACI 318.19. The 19 stands for 2019. This is a brand new spec, it just got released. Some of the equations that I've seen in some of the homeworks are like from specs that are 25, 30 years old. Uh, and so Chegg might've told you that's the answer and Chegg's wrong. Um, so I would just caution against using it, not because I'm trying to, to jump on anybody for some academic dishonesty or anything, but because it wasn't accurate. Whatever resource y'all were using, it was wrong. Um, so just, again, I'm here to help. If you all have any questions or, or, or if there's anything about the homework that doesn't make any sense, you can email me, you can call me, uh, and, and, I, and I'm there. So uh, just I would just be real careful about using that stuff, again, because it's more wrong than right. Um, let's get uh, into the topic today. Uh, we're, we're talking about columns today, and columns are going to be pretty easy for our purposes uh, in this class. Um, first off, uh, I want to um, sort of define some uh, a term for you at the beginning. We're going to use, or we're going to be looking at what are called short columns. And what I mean by short columns is that for the purposes of this class, and especially with what's going on with, with COVID-19, we're going to neglect buckling and, and the effects of slenderness and things like that in column design. So we, we refer to that in, in concrete design as a short column. So a short column is a column where we don't have to consider uh, stability or the effects of buckling or anything like that. Um, when for the columns that we look at, we're going to be looking at two different types of, of columns. Uh, we're going to be looking at square columns and we're going to be looking at circular columns. Now, in, in honesty, that's probably not the, the most technical way to refer to them from their behavior. Um, it, it, it's sort of a shorthand for what's going on inside the, the column. If you look at a column, uh, in, in a reinforced concrete column, you'll notice that there's always two sets of reinforcement. There's the bars that are going up and down, those longitudinal bars, those are the ones that are resisting the load that's being put on the column. So for instance, if I'm looking at the square column, the longitudinal bars are the four black dots, the, the, or on the bottom, the, the, below that, they're the bars that are running up and down. But then there's also the transverse reinforcement. The transverse reinforcement is what wraps around the column uh, from, from bottom to top. And there's two sorts of ways that you can do that. The first is to use what are called ties, so transverse ties. It's kind of like stirrups. So 
literally wraps of rebar, these little you know, ties that go up and down the column. The other uh, way to reinforce a column is to use what's called spiral reinforcement. So you still have your longitudinal bars going up and down. So for instance, if I'm looking at the circular column, the longitudinal bars would be the eight circular bars. The, the, you can see if you're looking at the, the column, there's the one, two, three, four, five, six, seven, eight bars the eight uh, uh, black dots. Those are the longitudinal bars that are going up and down. But then you have what looks like a, a spring. It's it's a spiral reinforcement that goes up the column. The, the reason that we use spiral reinforcement is spiral reinforcement serves to better confine the core of the column. And that confinement uh, is highly desirable when you're looking in earthquake prone regions or, or things like that, where you really want to confine the, the column under under high demand. Um, for most everyday columns, you probably don't need to do that. So for run-of-the-mill everyday columns, square columns will uh, will work just fine. Uh, so if, if I ever refer to square columns and circular columns, um, from a specification standpoint, what matters is whether or not they're tied or whether or not they contain spiral reinforcement. But typically in practice, that, that usually means that it, square columns have ties and circular columns have spiral reinforcement. You don't, usually you don't see us um, uh, the, the vice versa, although you can, uh, but that, that's just my, my shorthand for, for terminology for later. Now, in order to determine the capacity of a column, it's really simple. So let's say I have a column that has an area of AG, okay? so. For instance, if the column is 12 by 12, it has an area of 144 square inches. So 12 inches by 12 inches, area is 144. So of that 144 inches, the steel has an area of AST, whatever the the um, the area of the, the longitudinal reinforcement is. And the concrete has an area of AG minus that. So for instance, if you have a column and it's 12 by 12 inches, the gross area is 144. If it had, I don't know, let's say four number nines, so the steel is four square inches because it's four number nines, and then the area of the concrete is just 144 minus that. Um, uh, so the idea is you're saying of that column, what part steel and what part's concrete. So if we say that the steel can reach a stress of FY and the, or that's a typo, this says steel, it should say concrete right here, concrete. So if we say the steel uh, has an area of AST and it can reach FY, and then the concrete has an area of AG minus that, and it can reach a stress of 0.85 FC prime, then the theoretical capacity of a column is just 0.85 FC prime times the area of the concrete uh, plus FY times the area of the steel. It, it's pretty much that simple. The only thing that we do uh, for the actual design capacity is we adjust this for two things. The first thing we do, I mean, we throw in fee, we throw in our strength reduction factor, and I'll talk about that here in a second. But we also throw in this term alpha. Alpha accounts for uh, what we call accidental eccentricity. So when you do the math on uh, determining the capacity of a column and you do your structural analysis to determine the load on a column, you're assuming that that load is perfectly acting within the absolute dead centroid uh, of that column with pinpoint accuracy. And nobody's that, that good. You can't tell me with 100% certainty that the load is acting directly through the centroid. So we reduce the usable capacity a little bit to account for the fact that that load might be a little bit off kilter. If the, lo if the load is uh, away from the centroid, if it's not acting directly through the centroid, then you're going to have some accidental bending associated in the section as well. And it's enough that we should reduce our usable axial capacity to account for that. And I'll show you what alpha is here on the next slide. As for the fee value, um, we get that actually from our curve here on the bottom right. We've seen this curve before, but we really didn't talk about um, all of the curve and 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 I kind of want to talk about that today. So here we see the fee value as a function of the strain in the steel. So remember for beams, we wanted our strain to be larger than that limiting strain, the yield strain plus 0 0.003. And if it was, that meant our fee value was 0.9. Otherwise, we were a linear fit away from that. Now, what we did for beams is we used the solid orange curve for our fee value. So that equation that we used for fee came from the solid orange curve. 
And the reason why is because beams, if we're looking about their, their transverse reinforcement, uh, beams have ties. They, they use a tie reinforcement. Those stirrups are basically just ties. Um, but if our beams contain spiral reinforcement, then we would be able to use a, a different phi value. Now, I'm not really interested in the, the right part of the curve, the part where phi equals 0.9. I'm interested in the left part. See, remember, that curve is based on the tensile strain in the steel. Well, we're talking about a column. Columns have no tensile strain. Everything's in compression. So the tensile strain is zero. So our phi value, if you look at the curve, should either be 0.65 or 0.75, and it depends on whether or not we have spiral reinforcement or not. So what is the capacity of a column? Here it is. We take our theoretical capacity and we multiply it by phi and we multiply it by alpha. Alpha accounts for our accidental eccentricity and phi accounts for our uh, lateral reinforcement. For columns with tied lateral reinforcement, we use a phi value of 0.65 and an alpha value of 8, or sorry, 0.8. For columns with spiral uh, lateral reinforcement, we use phi of 0.75 and an alpha value of 0.85. See, see spiral columns, spirally reinforced columns, they, they confine the column a little bit better, so we can use a, a little bit of a higher phi value and a little bit of a higher alpha value. But if we're using regular old tie reinforcement, we got to drop that down a bit. And if you notice, these fee values are actually pretty low. Um, they're not like 0 0.9 or 0 0.65, 0 0.75. It all goes to the behavior of a column. I mean, if a column fails in compression, it can go quick. Um, I mean, uh, how many of you that, that took CE321 remember what your cylinder test looked like? You take that cylinder, you load it in compression. If it fails in a brittle mode, it goes quick. So... Um, so we want to ensure that, that we're, we're using an adequate level of safety. So our fee values are, are pretty low uh, as a result. Now, that's a plug and chug equation. That's super simple. Um, unfortunately, there, well, not unfortunately, it just, it's just the, the reality of it. There's a few more things that we kind of have to check with tied columns, um, uh, and that involves the, the details about the reinforcement. Now, what I decided to do is I actually uh, just wanted to screen clip various uh, snippets of the code um, just so you all can get an idea of what the code looks like. I mean, it, it's basically just just a document that has, you know, all your 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 um, your various provisions and equations and, and so on and so forth. Let, let's start looking at, at some of the, the provisions related to columns. So. For columns, if you notice here, there, there's sections from two different chapters. You can see there's stuff from chapter 10 and from chapter 25. Uh, the reason for that is chapter 10 is the chapter that relates specifically to columns, and chapter 25 is the chapter that relates to reinforcement details. So the way the code's organized, uh, 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 you'll have chapters like chapter 25 that's just reinforcement details for anything in concrete, and then chapter 10 is the one that's specifically on columns, uh, and so on and so forth. Uh, chapter 10 uh, has some provisions related to reinforcement. It says that the area of longitudinal reinforcement shall be at least 0 0.01 AG, but shall not exceed 0 0.08 AG. And so what that basically means, if you remember row values, your reinforcement ratios, it's stating that your reinforcement ratio has to be between 0 0.01 and 0 0.08. In other words, we have to provide some level of reinforcement in the column, but we can't provide too much. And so anytime we design a column, we got to keep our reinforcement between those values. Um, we also have uh, the minimum number of the longitudinal bars running up and down the, uh, the section or running up and down the column. For, um, for longitudinal bars, we have to keep that within uh, uh, four bars if the, um, the column is tied. If it's spirally reinforced, we have to keep that within six bars. Uh, don't worry, we've got an example where we're going to go through all this. Now, the tie bars, the ties that we use uh, along the column, uh, it's either got to be a number three or a number four. Uh, and that just depends on the size of the longitudinal bars. So you've got these longitudinal bars running up the column, and then the ties tie everything together. Well, you've got, if you've got this super huge, like, number 18 bar, a dinky little number three isn't enough to keep everything together. So we say that if you've got some pretty large bars, anything that's number 11 or bigger, um, we got to use a number four for the ties. Otherwise, we use a number three. So when we're designing a, a column, the tie selection is pretty simple. It's either number three or number four. As for the tie spacing itself, the tie spacing should be the least of 16 times the bar diameter, 
48 or 16 times the longitudinal bar diameter, 48 times the uh, tie bar diameter, or the smallest column dimension. And again, don't worry, I, I'm not expecting you to remember all this. We got a full blown example where we'll do all of this. It's it's really really pretty simple. Um, finally, I want to show you this. Um, what we're looking at here is a, a column. So the one on the left has six longitudinal bars, and you can see the the tie reinforcement around that. So you, as you're forming this up, you would space these ties and then then connect that to the uh, the longitudinal bars with some uh, wire twists and whatnot. Um, if you look at the the top and bottom layer, the top and bottom layer has, as you can see, three bars each. Okay, and ACI has a requirement that says that the spacing along that longitudinal tie uh, can't exceed six inches. And the, the idea is you want to make sure that the ties are actually performing their job. So if you have intermittent bars along the um, along the, the space, uh, then you're good. And I'll show you an example. If, if this column just had four bars where the bars were nestled up into the corners, we wouldn't need to worry about that. So if you look at the vertical dimension, I don't care about that dimension being greater than six inches because it's about the bars being supported along a single line uh, of the tie. If you ever have a situation where that is over six inches, like you, you, you don't need that many bars and that's going to be over, then you need to include like some additional reinforcement like a cross tie. So if you look here on the right, um, we might have a situation where that central bar on either end is over six inches away. So we throw in some cross ties just to make sure that the bars stay where they are. I mean, as we place the concrete, we want the bars to stay where they need to be uh, throughout the uh, the placement. Um, does anybody have any questions before I get right into our example? Because I think you're going to find this is this is pretty straightforward. Let me get my calcs here. All right, so I, I want to go through a full-blown ACI check of a column. So again, we've got a shape. We're putting compression on it. We're asking, what's the design axial capacity of this section? We'll say FC prime is 4 KSI and FY is 60 KSI. And so what do I got going on? I've got a square column that's 16 inches by 16 inches. Columns don't have to be square. They could be rectangular. There's nothing saying they have to be square, but most... Uh, most uh, uh, engineers would usually try and keep them square unless there's significant lateral demand in one direction. Maybe you've got like wind or earthquake this, uh, loads that are going to be really intense in one, one direction. You might have it wider one way than it is another. Um, we have eight longitudinal bars. Those are eight number nines. Um, we have an inch and a half of cover around the, the bars. And the ties are number three bars and they're spaced 16 inches uh, on center. Uh, again, I think you're going to find this is pretty straightforward. So let me um, move this over here. Give me one second. All right. So let's get started uh, with the, the, the calcs. Again, really simple. Um, so first off, let's, uh, let's write down the, um, let's remember for this FC prime is 4 KSI. Actually, let me do something. Let me make this a little bigger so that we can all read it. That tie text is a little small. All right, so FC prime, oh, go away. FC prime is 4 KSI and FY is 60 KSI. Now, we know that AST is uh, 8 square inches, which is 8 number 9s. And what about our gross area? Well, our gross area, it's a column that's 16 inches by 16 inches. So it's just B squared, which is 16 times 16, 
which is 256. Okay, that, that should be pretty straightforward. So for our design capacity, again, it, it's pretty simple. We take phi times alpha times 0 0.85 FC prime times the area of the concrete and think, the steel, so the whole column has an area of 256 square inches. The steel takes up eight square inches of that. So 0.85 FC prime times the area of the concrete. The area of the concrete is AG minus the area of the steel plus FY times the area of the steel. Again, should be, should be pretty simple. So I'm actually going to move this down here because it's just a lot of numbers. Now, remember, um, phi for a square tide column is 0 0.65, and alpha is 0 0.8, okay? Then 0 0.85 for KSI. Then we have 256 minus 8 square inches minus 60 KSI times 8 square inches. That's it. So somebody in chat tell me what the answer to that is. One eighty eight point eight six. I got a little bit of a different answer. Mine came out a little higher. I, I check your parentheses. Oh, sorry. Yeah, that's plus. That's plus. Sorry. That might have been it. That's a plus. That was my fault. All right, 688 point, yeah, that, that's what I got. So, VPN is 688.1 kips. That's it. So, if you want to know what's the design capacity of that column, that's it. I got to believe that's pretty simple. Um, that, that should be probably one of the simplest things we do uh, in the semester is just determining VPN for a column. Um, one other thing I'll mention, this is, this is a, a very typical FE problem is here's a column, what's the capacity? What's VPN? That's very, very possible on the exam. So We're not done. Uh, we're, we're not done. We got a little bit more to do. I saw that that uh, that Brandy. Um, the the short answer to your question is actually yeah, there is it is pretty simple like this, but you also have to do what's coming next, and that's the detailing checks. So, if you recall, I showed you that slide. Let me see if this works. Um, So if you remember, I showed you this slide. This was the uh, the, the detailing requirements, this one uh, and this one. Uh, so what I want to do is I want to go through each of these detailing checks one by one to ensure that the column meets the requirements of, of its proportions and, and the amount of reinforcement. So this is, it's not hard. It's just we've got a few things we got to get through. So let me go back to uh, to sharing the, the, the notebook and let's get into this. 
Now, while we're doing these calculations, I'm going to task somebody in chat for, for helping me out with something. Now, um, we have, oops, sorry, sorry about that. Okay, so we have the tie bars are number threes. What is the diameter of a number three? We're going to need that dimension here in a little bit. Three eighths, exactly right. Now, the longitudinal bars, hold on. The longitudinal bars are number nine. What's the diameter of a number nine? And I'll go ahead and tell you, it's not nine eighths. It doesn't work. Uh, once you get past number eight, the diameters, you can't just take the number and divide it by eight. Does anybody remember where to find it? I'll go ahead and give you a hint. So supplement three. Yes, yeah, so you said 1.13. That's that's correct. Uh, I'm gonna use I'm gonna use the one more decimal place. I'm gonna say it's 1.128. But but you're correct. If you go to supplement three, here, let me share that uh, just so that we're all seeing the same thing. So this is supplement three. And so we're looking at bar size and then the nominal diameter. And so for a number nine, the diameter is 1.128, okay? So if you look at the number threes to the number eights, you see how the pattern works, how it's three divided by eight, four divided by eight, five divided by eight. But once you get past number nine or number eights, it doesn't work like that. So you have to actually look up the uh, the diameter. Okay. Go back to the notebook. All right. So. So we're going to go through a series of detailing checks. They're going to be very, very uh, like formulaic, very rote. Uh, but let's do it step by step. First off, let's do the steel percentage. And the way that I do that is I compute what's called a gross uh, uh, row value, a reinforcement ratio. And so all I do is I take AST and I divide it by AG, okay? So AST is eight square inches and AG was 256. And so AST over AG, uh, you do the math and that'll come out to be 0 0.031, okay? And that is a good value, so that's okay. And the reason why is because it's got to be between 0 0.01 and 0 0.08. Okay. So it's got to be between those two values. All right. That's it. So the rest of these checks are going to be like this. It's just, you know, going through the, the, the motions. Okay. First, or the next check is the number of longitudinal bars. Now remind me, for this column, how many longitudinal bars are present?
not nine. There's there that is the size of the bar. They are number nine in size, but how many of them are there? Let me scroll up. There's eight of them. Yep, exactly right. So eight bars. And that is okay. That's good because that has to be greater than or equal to four for tied columns. For spirally reinforced columns, it's got to be greater than or equal to six. Okay. Like I said, they're pretty simple. You just got to go through the motions and do them. The, the last one is, I don't know, maybe a bit tricky, but you got to sort of think about, about how to do the math. All right, the minimum tie size. Now, what number bars are we using for the ties? Remind me. Make sure everybody's paying attention. Number threes, there you go. So number three bars. Now, what size are we using for the longitudinal bars? It's right there on the screen, but I'm making people in the chat respond. So somebody else, somebody who hadn't typed up something. What are the longitudinal bar sizes? Number nine, there you go. Here's why that matters, okay? Now I'm going to tell you that that we're using number three bars, and that's okay, because the minimum tie size. I'm just going to write it out. The minimum tie size is a number three if the longitudinal bars. are uh i'm gonna make sure i word it appropriately hold on i to use the right wording uh are number 10 or smaller so if your longitudinal bars are number 10 or smaller the tie size needs to be has a minimum size of number three we're using number three so that that's good. You can use a larger size if you want, but usually folks just go with the minimum because it doesn't really matter so much the tie size, it's how far apart you space them. So usually folks just go with the minimum in design in design land. All right. Next comes the uh, minimum tie spacing. Okay. The minimum tie spacing, we usually use um, uh, the bar diameter, but l let me be clear, uh, the, the, this really isn't going to affect our design. So this is 1.128. What's going to matter is the maximum tie spacing, and, and you're going to see what I mean here in a second. So... To determine the maximum tie spacing, you need to do three things, okay? First thing you need to do is you need to figure out 48 tie bar diameters So 48 and remind me what's the diameter of the tie bar? We'll get folks in chat to respond I'm gonna keep y'all engaged I'm gonna wait. What was the diameter of the tie bar? There we go. There we go. Three eighths of an inch. All right. So 48 times three eighths. Uh, 48 divided by eight is six. Six times three is 18. Okay. Uh, 16 
longitudinal bar diameters. is 16 times now the longitudinal bar diameter I have that up here that's 1.128 and that is I uh, do the math it's like 18.05 yep and then we also use the least column dimension so now for this problem, the column is 16 inches by 16 inches, so that's just 16. If we had a column that was rectangular, if it was uh, 16 inches by 24 inches, we would just use the smaller one. So of these three, the minimum is what controls. So the max tie spacing is the 16 inches. So here, here's sort of the point, okay? Here's our minimum. Here's our maximum. What's our actual tie spacing for this column? Does anybody remember? It's 16 inches, exactly. So your tie spacing has got to be between the minimum and the maximum. And so this is good because it's right there at the maximum. And in design land, we typically go with, with near the maximum. Uh, we never really space ties so close together that we start hitting the minimum. That never really happens. So usually your ties will, um, will off of the, uh, uh, go off the maximum. So that's, that's basically it. Uh, we, except for, except for one check. Okay. Now I'm going to, I'm going to copy and paste this image because I'm going to be a little lazy. Okay. The last thing that we have to check is our clear bar spacing. I'm going to make this a little big because I kind of want to kind of want to illustrate something. So so first off the the column is square. So we really only need to check one side. If it was a rectangular section, uh, we would need to check not only left and right, but we would also need to check up and down. But we would, you could probably, you'll see here in a second how we could probably um, use a little bit of judgment and only check one side. And, and that'll become clear here in a second. Okay, so let me actually, let me move that down a bit. Let's check clear bar spacing now to be clear that no pun intended um what i'm after is i'm trying to figure out what this dimension is right here that's what i'm trying to figure out and, and the reason i'm trying to figure that out is because i want to know whether or not that is less than or equal to six inches okay if you remember uh let me go back to the slideshow here because I can hop around a little easy with this. So this is our requirement. And remember, the bar spacing, that clear bar spacing inside a lateral tie has to uh, be less than or equal to six inches. Okay, so I want to check that dimension. Um, let me go back to this. And show you how I'm going to compute that. Uh, so I want to show you what I'm going to do here. So let's let's start off with 16 inches. Okay. Now, first thing I'm going to do is I'm going to subtract two times one and a half. Okay. And the reason I'm doing that is because the cover on each end, that's 1.5 inches. If you look uh, a little bit lower, you can see how 1.5 inch cover is typical. And that's from the edge of the column to the edge of the rebar, to that face. That, that clear distance is one and a half inches. Okay? Oh, go away. Now, Next thing I'm going to do 
is I'm going to subtract. Sorry. Two times three eighths, because that's that dimension. Remember, three eighths inch ties. And then to be conservative, I know you could account for these like rounded sections here on the corner, but to be conservative, here, here's what I'm gonna do. If I were to just compute this, this formula as it stands right here, that would give me this dimension, that clear distance from face to face. What I'm going to do is I'm going to then subtract three longitudinal bars. So the idea is I'll subtract like that dimension, that dimension out, and that dimension out because there's three longitudinal bars. And then I'll take the whole thing and cut it in two. Because once I subtract those three bars, I have one, two spaces that I need to figure out. If I had, let's say, see how I've got three bars along one of the ties? If I had, let's say, four bars along the ties, I would subtract four times the bar diameter and then divide the whole thing by three. Uh, hopefully that makes sense. Um, so somebody chug this formula out and tell me what you get. Four point four three three inches. Is that good? Four point four three inches. And remember, that dimension has to be less than or equal to six inches. So, whoop. sorry, less than or equal to six inches. So that's that's good. So what I can say then is ACI requirements. are met. All right. Um, before I open it up to questions, I want to um, I want to show you all something. Uh, a couple of a couple of things. So a couple thought bubbles. So first off, what if the column looked like this? What if the column was, instead of square, what if it was a rectangular column? And I had one, two, three, four, five, six, seven, eight. Like, let's say that was my reinforcement and I had my ties sort of going like this. All right. If that's the case, if I had a column like this, what I would probably do is I would probably just check this dimension because if that dimension works, I can guarantee you that the other one works. Just because by observation, if I meet the requirements here on the other one, it's, it's less spacing. So that's probably what I would do is just check the one, uh, unless the column dimensions were really tiny. You don't want the bars getting too close together, but that that wouldn't I think would really happen in a practical setting. The other note I want to make is if you have a column that looks like this. And you have just that, 
just four bars. If that's all you've got, then you do not need to go through and do uh, this check up here. You don't need to do that. The, the six inch check is for bars that are intermediate. Like if you had, uh, if you had a bar here, then you would want to make sure that dimension uh, is less than six inches. Otherwise, if they're nestled up into the corners of the ties, ain't got to worry about it. So again, if you've got that and there's only four bars, don't worry about the, the six inch check. It, it, doesn't, it, it doesn't matter. All right, any questions? I'm going to pull up your homework here in a second. Um, let me pull up the homework. All right, so here's the, uh, the homework. Um, very similar problem. So I want you to determine VPN and also do all the design check or the, the detailing checks. Um, so the, the VPN should be really simple. The rest should be just, again, it's just plug and chug stuff. Go through the notes and make sure that, that you you understand all of the, the code language. Uh, and again, like I said at the beginning of lecture, don't put all your uh, faith and, and uh, trust in Chegg. Uh, it, it has a tendency with, with stuff like concrete design and steel and anything that's code specific, it has a tendency to be more wrong than right. So you be cautious of that. Um, any other quick questions before I call it? We still got a couple minutes. Our today's is posted on Blackboard. They will be. I hadn't. I hadn't. I literally just finished them uh, right before class. Uh, go back to your notes page one more time. Um, hold on. Uh, do you want me to, do I need to scroll up, scroll down? Okay. Uh, yeah, Victoria, they will be. I um, uh, I just, I literally just finished them right before class. I'm going to post them, uh, like, I'm hoping to get it posted between now and steel. So in the next few minutes. Any other questions? All right. Well, for those of you in steel design, I'll see you here in a few minutes. For everybody else, uh, y'all have a good weekend. We'll see you on Monday. That's all I got.